Dr. Kevin Hector is Associate Professor of Theology and the Philosophy of Religions at the University of Chicago Divinity School. He's well known for his constructive work in theology, First Theology Without Metaphysics, from Cambridge Press in 2011, and then The Theological Project of Modernism, Faith in the Conditions of Mindness, with Oxford University Press in 2015. He's also known, of course, for the numerous articles and reviews that he's published. I know him as a very careful, very erudite, and unfailingly charitable reader of modern theology, as well as a brilliant expositor of it. We are really privileged to have uh, Dr. Hector here with us today. Let's welcome Kevin Hector. This is quite a podium. I'm glad I wore clean pants. So as I was revising my paper uh, yesterday and the day before, I uh, kept thinking of the Schleiermacher joke. There's one joke about Schleiermacher. Uh, the joke goes like this. A couple of students are new to the University of Berlin, and they say, let's go hear the famous Dr. Schleiermacher lecture I've heard so much about him, let's, let's go hear him lecture. And so they come and they sit in the lecture hall and they hear him speak. And after almost an hour, one of them gets so frustrated, says, I can't make heads or tails of this, let's just go. And the other one responds, let's at least wait till he gets to the verb. <laughs> Did somebody hiss? Um, I thought about that while I was revising because I've tried to take as many quotations from Schleiermacher out of the paper you'll hear as I can. Uh, you won't feel that way about my paper because it won't last an hour. Uh, thank you, Professor McCall, for your warm welcome. Thank you. I want to say a special word of thanks to Jeffrey Fulkerson. I don't know if you've seen him around, but he has done, he's done tireless work putting together this conference, and so I'm especially grateful to him uh, for making this happen. I think it's, a, it's been a blessing to me to be here. Hopefully it will be for you as well. So, on to my paper. When theologians tell the story of modern theology, Friedrich Schleiermacher is almost always cast as the villain. He could easily be so cast in this conference too, since he is customarily portrayed as a sort of arch accommodationist a theologian who all too willingly revises Christian commitments simply so as to render them acceptable by the lights of modern science. As it happens, however, the customary portrayal of Schleiermacher is wrong, and his actual approach to science turns out to be much more robustly theological and, I think, more interesting than is usually recognized. That's what I will argue in this paper, at any rate. More specifically, I will argue, first, that Schleiermacher defends a distinctively theological diagnosis of characteristically modern science-induced anxieties about the possibility of freedom in a world governed by laws of nature. His diagnosis, simply stated, is that relative antitheses, such as that between freedom and necessity, come to seem absolute just insofar as one is forgetful of that which transcends the world, namely God. I then argue that Schleiermacher elaborates an equally theological solution to this problem, the basic steps of which are as follows. Schleiermacher claims, A, that God is simple, which means God is not only eternally in act, but eternally in one act. From this it follows, B, that the fabric-like character of creation can be understood as an expression of this one act. C, that this one act of God comes to full expression in the Incarnation, which shows us that God's single act is an act of love, and that the fabric of creation is thus an expression of God's love. And finally, D, that the Spirit of Christ gives us eyes to see more and more of God's wise love in creation, and so to harmonize more and more of the apparent antitheses between freedom and necessity. Finally, I argue briefly that there are several interesting insights we might glean from Schleiermacher's approach, 
the most important of which is what I would term his practical doctrine of creation. That is, his emphasis on the sort of practices and dispositions one would have to cultivate such that one could treat the world, including oneself, as God's good creation. This approach, in turn, opens up an interesting way of thinking from a theological perspective about the practice of natural science, a way that, at least to my unscientific ears, sounds promising. Before proceeding, an important clarification is in order. Although Schleiermacher took pains to familiarize himself with the best science of his time, his theology interacts much more with the idea of science than with science per se. By this, I mean that although Schleiermacher does occasionally engage with actual scientific theories, Lamarckian evolutionary theory, for instance, his theological focus is on what we might call the scientific worldview, by which I mean, very roughly, a view according to which the world is governed by exceptionless natural laws. I happen to think that contemporary theology would be enriched by engaging more and more with actual science, but that is not to discount the importance of dealing with the idea of science, too. In any case, that's where Schleiermacher focuses his energies, so it is likewise where I will focus the energies of my paper. Onward, then, to my argument. To understand Schleiermacher's approach to these issues and why it is significant, we need to understand a bit more about the intellectual milieu in which he wrote. To say everything at once, and a bit too bluntly, Philosophers, theologians, and other intellectuals from this period were everywhere animated by the question of how freedom could be possible in a machine-like universe. That is to say, in light not only of advances in natural science, but the ever harder to ignore worldview that these advances seemed to support. A worldview, in short, according to which everything in the world operates according to exceptionless natural laws, and so a world that operates more or less mechanistically, in light of this worldview, these thinkers faced the obvious, pressing question. Where is the place in such a world for freedom? Human freedom, to be sure, but divine freedom, too. The list of thinkers who tied themselves in knots trying to answer this question is a veritable who's who of modern thought. Think here, for instance, of Descartes' bizarre conjectures about the pineal gland, or Malebranche's occasionalism, or Spinoza's rationalistic compatibilism, or Leibniz's pre-established harmonies. But for our purposes, it will be useful to say a bit more about just one example, that of Schleiermacher's near contemporary Immanuel Kant. Kant claims, as is well known, that the sensible realm of nature is governed by mechanistic laws, whereas the supersensible realm of freedom is governed by the moral law. The existence of these realms so construed brings us to what Kant sees as an apparently insoluble problem, namely that, quote, the domain of the concept of nature under the one legislation and that of the concept of freedom under the other are entirely barred from any mutual influence that they could have on each other by themselves, each in accordance with its fundamental laws, by a great chasm that separates the supersensible from appearances. The concept of freedom determines nothing in regard to the theoretical cognition of nature. The concept of nature likewise determines nothing in regard to the practical laws of freedom. And it is to this extent not possible to throw a bridge from one domain to the other." End quote. Kant's problem, then, is this. A, the, super, I'm sorry, the sensible realm is governed by natural laws. B, the supersensible realm, the realm of freedom, is governed by the moral law. C, a will governed by the moral law necessarily intends to have an effect in the natural realm, the sensible realm. Yet D, given the sensible realm's government by natural laws, it seems impossible for the moral law to have such effects, from which it would follow E, that contrary to one's intention, one cannot bring phenomena into conformity with the moral law, and accordingly that one is not actually free. Kant has his own solution to this problem, of course, but for my purposes, the relevant point is simply that Kant, like so many of his predecessors, was animated by the question of how freedom is possible in a world governed by natural laws 
of the sort discoverable by science. With that problem in mind, we're now in position to understand Schleiermacher's contribution to our discussion. That contribution can be summarized in terms of the following claims. A, that creaturely life is characterized by relative freedom and relative dependence. B, that relative freedom and dependence hang together only insofar as both are absolutely dependent upon a transcendent God. C, that freedom and dependence are at odds with one another for humans insofar as we do not integrate them into our consciousness of absolute dependence, since we then treat relative freedom and dependence as if they were absolute. And D, that if a person were wholly to integrate freedom and dependence into his consciousness of absolute dependence, then he or she would no longer experience freedom and dependence as if they were at odds. In what follows, we'll consider these claims roughly in turn. Throughout his mature works, one of Schleiermacher's favorite argumentative strategies is to claim that various finite oppositions can be overcome only in relation to an absolute in which these opposites coincide. We see an instance of this strategy in Schleiermacher's Glaubenslehre, in which he, frames, which he frames in terms of his claim that creaturely freedom and dependence can be united only in relation to God. He builds up to this claim by arguing, first, that, quote, in every moment of self-consciousness, there are two elements, which we might call respectively a self-posited element and a non-self-posited element. And that the latter presupposes for every moment of self-consciousness another factor besides the I, a factor which is the source of the particular determination and without which the self-consciousness would not be precisely what it is, end quote. The idea here is straightforward enough. Every moment of one's life, Schleiermacher argues, is determined partly by oneself and partly by that which is other than one. Schleiermacher terms these respectively the spontaneous and receptive elements of one's experience, which correspond in self-consciousness with a feeling of freedom and a feeling of dependence. Schleiermacher then argues that receptivity and spontaneity characterize not only one's own experience of the world, but the world itself. To substantiate this point, he begins by considering an idealized example in which one's spontaneity and receptivity would correspond precise, I'm sorry, are related to a single object. In such a case, he claims, one's spontaneity would correspond precisely with the object's receptivity, and one's receptivity would correspond with its spontaneity. Schleiermacher characterizes such relationships as reciprocal and claims that all worldly relationships exemplify such reciprocity, since every spontaneous action affects something else, and every being affected is due to some spontaneous act in an organic network of mutual interrelationship. The entire realm of such reciprocity just is the world, which Schleiermacher thus understands as a sort of organism, or a hanging together of all finite entities, in which each is receptive to the spontaneity of all, and all receptive to the spontaneity of each. From these claims about the world and one's place in it, Schleiermacher draws two decisive conclusions. The first, more obvious conclusion is that nothing in the world is absolutely free. Schleiermacher offers two reasons for this conclusion. The first is that an action is free on Schleiermacher's account only if something is affected by it, yet the very presence of such a thing implies receptivity on the side of the actor not least inasmuch as the thing's existence is not itself due to one's freedom. The second reason is that one's own existence, including one's freedom, is not itself due to one's freedom. Even if I could presently act altogether freely, my very being could not itself be a product of that freedom, because my birth, for instance, was not something I brought about freely, nor was my being supplied with the physical and educational resources necessary to my eventual coming of age as a free person. On the strength of these arguments, Schleiermacher concludes that in any temporal existence, a feeling of absolute freedom can have no place. This brings us to Schleiermacher's second conclusion, 
namely that we, along with everything else in the world, are absolutely dependent, and that our relative freedom makes us immediately conscious of this fact. Schleiermacher argues toward this end that, quote, the self-consciousness which accompanies all our activity and negates absolute freedom is itself precisely a consciousness of absolute dependence. For it is the consciousness that the whole of our spontaneous activity comes from a source outside of us, in just the same sense in which anything toward which we should have a feeling of absolute freedom must have proceeded entirely from ourselves." End quote. On its face, this argument might seem to entail that one is absolutely dependent upon the world, since one's birth, sustenance, etc. are apparently due to worldly factors, just as the objects to which one's freedom is directed are altogether worldly. Schleiermacher counters, however, that one's consciousness of absolute dependence finds its terminus neither in any worldly entity nor in the world itself, since A, everything in the world is likewise caught up in a reciprocal relationship of spontaneity and receptivity, and so is not the spontaneous source of its own spontaneity, and B, the world itself is constituted by the entire network of such reciprocal relationships, and is therefore partly dependent upon one's freedom. As such, it cannot be the terminus of one's absolute dependence. Schleiermacher argues, accordingly, that everything in the world is absolutely dependent and that humans are immediately conscious of this fact. Schleiermacher thus understands the world and our place in it in terms of the relative opposition between freedom and dependence and claims that this opposition is transcended and so recognizable as relative in light of that which absolutely transcends both. In order to elaborate this point, we must first register a terminological shift. Given his view of the world and one's place in it, Schleiermacher gathers the entire realm of relative freedom and dependence into the category of sensible life and terms one's awareness of this realm sensible self-consciousness. Likewise, given his claims about the entire world's absolute dependence on that which transcends it, Schleiermacher contends that one's awareness of such dependence lies at the root of the concept God, such that one's consciousness of absolute dependence can equally be termed one's God consciousness. Hence, when Schleiermacher hereafter discusses God consciousness, he is referring to one's consciousness of absolute dependence, and when he discusses sensible self-consciousness, he is referring to one's consciousness of relative freedom and dependence, that is, one's consciousness of the reciprocal relationships by which the world and one's place in it is constituted. With that terminology on board, we can now say more about how Schleiermacher understands their relationship. There are, in fact, two ways in which the God consciousness and the sensible consciousness can relate, depending upon the extent to which the latter is integrated into the former. If the sensible consciousness is integrated into the God consciousness, then one will experience one's life as a unified whole. If not, then one will experience freedom and dependence as at odds with one another, and one's life, therefore, as pervaded by oppositions. Schleiermacher argues, accordingly, that the freedom and dependence characteristic of sensible life need not stand in opposition to one another, and that they will not so stand insofar as one unites each in one's consciousness of absolute dependence. Schleiermacher thus contrasts, quote, the sensible self-consciousness, which rests entirely upon the antithesis between freedom and dependence, with the feeling of absolute dependence in which the antithesis again disappears, and the subject unites and identifies itself with everything which was set over against it. The more one is conscious of one's absolute dependence, therefore, the less one's freedom will seem to be at odds with one's dependence, or so Schleiermacher claims. Every moment of one's sensible consciousness can thereby be taken up into one's God consciousness and can in this way be experienced as hanging together. Thus far, then, Schleiermacher has claimed that the entire realm of sensible life, including one's relationship to nature as well as other persons, can be included in one's God consciousness, and that the God consciousness can therefore integrate all of one's freedom and dependence vis-a-vis -vis the world. 
Schleiermacher also thinks that God consciousness is a necessary condition of such integration, which becomes clear when he considers what happens when persons become insufficiently attuned to the God consciousness and therefore lack the facility, his word, for introducing the God consciousness into the course of our actual lives and retaining it there. In that case, one experiences, quote, an obstruction or arrest of the vitality of the higher self-consciousness, so that there comes to be little or no union of it with the various determinations of the sensible self-consciousness, and thus little or no religious life. We may give to this condition, in its most extreme form, the name of godlessness, or better, God-forgetfulness, end quote. Um, this, in a nutshell, is his diagnosis of modern concerns with freedom's apparent incompatibility with natural necessities, right? It is a form of God forgetfulness. As Schleiermacher sees it then, persons may relate to the world as if it, including but not limited to their place in it, were absolute or ultimate, and thus forget that the world is absolutely dependent whether they mean to or not. As a result, they invariably relate to finite oppositions, including especially the opposition of freedom and necessity, as if they too were absolute. This has exactly the consequence we have been led to expect. Insofar as we fail to integrate freedom and dependence into our God consciousness, we experience them as contradicting one another, and our lives are thus marked by dissonance. We thereby reap what we have sown, for if the finite world is treated as if it were absolute, then the oppositions by which that world is constituted will likewise be treated as absolute, and we will experience the world as frozen into intractable contradictions. On Schleiermacher's account, then, God consciousness is a necessary as well as a sufficient condition for integrating freedom and dependence, for without it, one cannot integrate them. Unfortunately, once one has become disposed to subordinate the God consciousness to the sensible consciousness, one can do nothing to reorient oneself, for the apparent reason that any such reordering would itself necessarily be brought within one's worldly horizon. Schleiermacher thus contends that, quote, under these conditions, no satisfaction of the impulse toward the God consciousness will be possible. And so, if such a satisfaction is to be attained, a redemption is necessary, since this condition is nothing but a kind of imprisonment or constraint of the feeling of absolute dependence." End quote. This brings us to the heart of Schleiermacher's theology, namely humanity's redemption in Christ. We should now be well positioned to understand the best known feature of Schleiermacher's Christology, namely the centrality he accords to Jesus' perfect God consciousness, since this is precisely what must be restored in us if we are to be redeemed. Schleiermacher thus contends that, quote, the capacity of the God consciousness to give the impulse to all of life's experiences and to determine them is the ideal which humanity was meant to instantiate and that this ideal was perfectly realized in Jesus, inasmuch as he himself was the ideal, the ideal become completely historical, and each historical moment of his experience at the same time bore within it that ideal." End quote. Schleiermacher's fundamental Christological claim, then, is that Jesus, unlike all others, had a perfectly potent God consciousness, and that every moment of his life was perfectly harmonized with that consciousness. We need to say more about what such harmonization actually looked like, but first an objection. In light of Schleiermacher's other claims, one might reasonably wonder how anyone's God consciousness, including Jesus, could harmonize each of their experiences, since he elsewhere contends that normal human development, along with the God forgetfulness of our communities, renders this impossible. Schleiermacher's response to this objection is twofold. He argues first that the perfection of Jesus' God consciousness must have been due to a miraculous act of God, since he grants that such a consciousness could not possibly have arisen in the natural course of human history and development. Schleiermacher hastens to add, however, that this supernatural act, 
need not be thought to disrupt the hanging together of nature, and thus the consciousness of absolute dependence, since the act that produces this God consciousness is one and the same as the act by which the world is created and preserved. Schleiermacher claims accordingly that, quote, both events, both creation on the one hand and the appearance of the Redeemer on the other, both events go back to one undivided eternal decree and form, even in a higher sense, only one and the same natural system. And indeed that the first stage of creation, namely the act to which creation owes its very existence, is ordained by God only in view of the second namely the act of recreating humanity in Jesus." End quote. The importance of this point will become clearer in a moment. The second component of Schleiermacher's response is his argument that, again, unlike everyone else, Jesus' development was such that his God consciousness was at every moment sufficiently powerful to determine his sensible consciousness, though not, for that reason, all powerful. Jesus was not born with an absolutely powerful God consciousness, therefore, but with a sufficiently powerful one. Sufficiently powerful, that is, to outpace the development of his sensible consciousness. Hence, whereas human development and corporate sinfulness ensure that everyone else's sensuous consciousness dominates their God consciousness, Schleiermacher argues that Jesus' God consciousness was supernaturally implanted by God in consequence of which his development and participation in society were unable to curb the power of that consciousness. Schleiermacher thus claims that Jesus' God consciousness was sufficiently powerful to determine every moment of sensible consciousness. From this, he draws the striking conclusion that Jesus incarnates the pure activity in which God eternally subsists. The argument here is straightforward enough though not straightforward enough for his readers to understand. If A, the whence of absolute dependence is pure activity, and B, Jesus' perfect receptivity to this whence governs his reception of and activity toward the world, then C, the latter receptivity and activity are pure activity vis-a-vis -vis the world, since they are conditioned not by the world but only by an absolute receptivity toward God, from which it follows D, that Jesus' receptivity and activity reproduce within the world God's own activity. This explains Schleiermacher's assertion that, quote, every moment of his existence, so far as it can be isolated, presents just such a new incarnation and incarnatedness of God, because always and everywhere, all that is human in him springs from the divine. It likewise explains what Schleiermacher has in mind when he claims that to ascribe to Christ an absolutely powerful God consciousness and to attribute to him an existence of God in him are exactly the same thing, since his perfectly receptive God consciousness ensures that every moment of Jesus' life reproduces as his own the pure activity in which God subsists. There's also a Trinitarian outworking of this, such that incarnation is the incarnation of the eternal word of God, but this is the bit that's relevant for our purposes. The fact that Jesus incarnates this activity demonstrates, moreover, that the one upon whom we depend absolutely is not just any pure activity, but the pure activity of love. To be absolutely dependent, therefore, is to depend wholly upon God's love, and to let that love govern one's reception of and activity toward the world. The fact that love is the pure activity to which Jesus is perfectly receptive, and which his life therefore reproduces as his own pure activity vis-a-vis -vis the world, becomes clear in Jesus' most apparently passive moments, most notably in his suffering. Nowhere is this clearer than in Jesus' crucifixion. For, quote, in his suffering unto death, occasioned by his steadfastness, there is manifested to us an absolutely self-denying love. And in this, there is represented to us with perfect vividness the way in which God was in him to reconcile the world to himself." End quote. Hence, if Jesus perfectly reproduces the pure activity in which God subsists, then it turns out that God subsists in the singular activity of reconciling love. 
In light of Jesus, therefore, we can see why love alone is made the equivalent of the being or essence of God. On this account, therefore, to be absolutely dependent is to depend absolutely upon God's reconciling love. That brings us to a crucial claim, namely that one can be redeemed from one's God-forgetfulness through being included in this love, or better, reoriented toward it. To understand how Schleiermacher accounts for such reorientation, we have to consider first how Christ's God consciousness could be communicated to others in order thereby to become their own. Jesus accomplishes this, Schleiermacher argues, by drawing others into the activity of his life. He acts not only upon every circumstance of his own life, but upon other persons, in such a way that his activity becomes theirs. Schleiermacher thus asserts that, quote, whatever in human nature is assumed into vital fellowship with Christ is assumed into the fellowship of an activity determined solely by the power of the God consciousness, which God consciousness is adequate to every new experience and extracts from it all it has to yield. And therefore, that each assumption of this sort is simply a continuation of the same creative act which first manifested itself in time by the formation of Christ's person." End quote. On this account, then, Jesus is perfectly receptive to God's pure act and perfectly reproduces it as his own action. In redeeming us, Christ makes us receptive to his receptivity so that it becomes ours too. For Schleiermacher then, Jesus is perfectly receptive to God's reconciling love and perfectly reproduces it as his own. And in redeeming us, Jesus makes us receptive to his receptivity so that we too can receive and reproduce God's love. There is then a sort of transitive property at work here, which Schleiermacher understands as, and in turn uses to explain, the work of Christ's spirit. To explain how this works, Schleiermacher develops a model according to which a multifarious community of God consciousness continually forms and is in turn formed by believers. The key components of this model may be summarized somewhat drastically as follows. First, those whose God consciousness has been attuned to Christ, beginning with the original disciples, express that attunement through their gestures, words, actions, and recognition-laden responses to such expressions. If others recognize this person's expressions as properly receptive to Christ's influence, they may imitate them in similar circumstances until they have become reliably disposed to do so, at which point these expressions become part of their own attunement. Still others may then recognize the latter's expressions as attuned to Christ, imitate those expressions, become reliably disposed to repeat them, and so on. In this way, the spirit of Christ's own receptivity would be carried forward through a chain of intersubjective recognition, and persons' lives would thereby be reordered to God. The community founded, founded by Jesus is the means, therefore, by which his God consciousness is communicated to others. Their reception of this God consciousness would obviously liberate them from their God forgetfulness, which is why Schleiermacher terms this the redemptive activity of Jesus. This is the basis, in turn, of Jesus' reconciliatory activity, since having a renewed God consciousness enables one to reintegrate relative freedom and dependence, and so increasingly restore one's sense of harmony with the world. On Schleiermacher's account, that is to say, one is redeemed when Jesus' God consciousness becomes one's own, just as one is reconciled when his unclouded blessedness becomes so. Again, because every moment of his life was determined by a perfect receptivity toward God's reconciling love, Jesus could be reconciled even to circumstances that seem opposed to this love, for reconciling love is precisely that which relativizes and overcomes such opposition. God forgetfulness treats worldly oppositions as absolute and so experiences them as contradictions. God consciousness, by contrast, is conscious of the ultimacy of reconciling love and so treats these same oppositions as that which is to be united in that which is truly absolute. Once one's God consciousness has been restored accordingly, one likewise participates in Jesus' reconciliation to his circumstances. Schleiermacher thus claims that, quote, the redeemed man too, since he has been assumed into the vital fellowship of Christ, 
is never filled with the consciousness of any evil. These are hindrances to the God consciousness. For it cannot touch or hinder the life he shares with Christ. All hindrances to life, natural and social, come to him even in this region only as indications, indications of where one should be taking something up into dependence upon God. They are not taken away as if he were to be or could be without pain and free from suffering, for Christ also knew pain and suffered in the same way. Only the pains and sufferings do not mean simple misery, for they do not as such penetrate into the inmost life. They're transformed in their being taken up into God consciousness. Jesus' redemptive work thus plays a key role in his reconciling work. Since, by restoring persons' God consciousness, and so their receptivity to God's reconciling love, he enables them to experience worldly oppositions as expressions of that love or of their vocation to depend upon God in all circumstances. Those who are redeemed can therefore integrate all of their circumstances and they themselves into their God consciousness because they trust that these circumstances are one and all absolutely dependent upon a wise, loving God. With these claims on board, we can now see that Schleiermacher offers a theological diagnosis of and prescription for characteristically modern anxieties about freedom and necessity. From his vantage point, the seeming antithesis between one's freedom and that upon which one is dependent manifest in natural as well as social antagonisms, is due to God-forgetfulness. For the relativity of such antitheses, along with their possible coincidence, can be recognized only when they are set in relation to one upon whom both are absolutely dependent. To overcome these antitheses, therefore, reconciliation is necessary, which is what Schleiermacher claims has been accomplished in Christ and mediated through his spirit. Christ is perfectly God-conscious, Schleiermacher argues, and is thus able to bring every moment of his sensible consciousness, including his relative freedom and dependence, into unity with that God-consciousness. By founding a community and conveying his spirit to others, Jesus enables them to share in that God-consciousness and so to bring their lives into absolute dependence upon God. As such, the redeemed will increasingly perceive all that is as absolutely dependent upon God, particularly upon God's loving wisdom. And since one's freedom will itself be shaped by one's dependence upon God, it follows that one will see the world's relative oppositions as not finally opposed to that freedom. Thus far, however, Schleiermacher's account operates at a fairly high level of abstraction, so in the next section, we will consider a couple of specific examples of what it might actually look like if one were to develop this account. That brings us finally to a brief consideration of some insights we might borrow from Schleiermacher's approach. One insight, almost too obvious to mention in the present context, would be that a scientific worldview ought not to be absolutized. But we could get this insight almost anywhere. Much more interesting, I think, is what I would characterize as Schleiermacher's practical doctrine of creation. A doctrine of creation, that is, that focuses on the practices and dispositions one would have to cultivate in order to respond to the world, including oneself, as the creation of a loving God. As my parting shot, then, I will elaborate two examples of what such practices might look like, both of which follow the spirit rather than the letter of Schleiermacher's theology. The first example is the practice of prayer, specifically petitionary prayer. In petitionary prayer, one brings one's concern about various goods before God, and in so doing, one subjects that concern to God, usually by entrusting it to God. In turn, entrusting it as such should change one's emotional response to or emotional investment in the object of that concern paradigmatically by positioning one to perceive its well-being as due to God's goodness and so to receive it with gratitude. If all goes well, then, one who prays should feel not only joy but gratitude if things go well with the object of one's concern and a kind of trustful resignation or defiance if it does not such that one's concern for these goods itself becomes an expression of one's devotion to God. 
Over time, such prayers can transform one's emotional dispositions, such that, crucially, one becomes increasingly disposed to entrust all of one's concerns to God and experience all goods as God's gifts, which is to say that one becomes increasingly disposed to relate to the world as God's creation. Surely, to experience all goods as God's gifts is a crucial way of expressing what Schleiermacher terms the feeling of absolute dependence. A second example is what I would call, following Simone Weil, the practice of attention. And here I particularly mean attention to the non-personal world. Think here, for instance, of the way nature photographers, on the one hand, and poets like Marianne Moore, on the other, train themselves to see the world from a variety of perspectives, to notice not only intricate details, but the potential significance of such details, and to convey their discoveries to others. Insofar as they do so, photography and poetry count as practices of attention, as I'm using that phrase. Natural science, too, would obviously count as such a practice, inasmuch as scientists have trained themselves to investigate our world with an exacting precision, to see the significance of its every detail and so forth. But that brings us to a crucial, if not the crucial point. In order to contribute to a practical doctrine of creation, what matters is not simply that one engages in such practices of attention, but that these practices cultivate and are expressions of particular dispositions especially the disposition to appreciate or wonder at the world. There is a vital difference, that is to say, between a person who observes an ant colony simply in order to chart its various branches, circumstance responses, re responsive changes, etc., and someone who does these things with a sense of how interesting or impressive or mind-boggling or well-designed or beautiful it is. Insofar as practices of attention cultivate in our expressions of the latter sensibilities, then they too dispose one to treat the world as God's creation, and just so contribute to what I am calling a practical doctrine of creation. And while I cannot do justice to the point here, I would argue that they can so contribute even if the person practicing them does not realize that they are doing so. We could defend the point by appealing to an externalist account of reference, but for now I will simply offer an analogy. Suppose a picture that my daughter has painted, or a robot she has built, is on display somewhere, and that the people looking at it are admiring its use of light, or marveling at its design, or whatever. Even if they mistakenly think that the painting and robot were created by one of her teachers, or if they have no thought whatsoever about who created them, they are still appreciating and wondering at her creations, and their doing so redounds to her praise even if they themselves are not in position to realize it. And while it would surely be better if they knew who the creator was and so rightly directed their admiration to her, it does not change the fact that they are admiring her creation all the same. I would say the same of practices of attention. So long as they cultivate and are expressions of a sense of appreciation for and wonder at the world, they train one to treat the world as God's creation. Better still, of course, if their practitioners could not only treat but recognize it as such, but these practices can contribute to a practical doctrine of creation even absent such recognition. This strikes me as a potential worthwhile way to approach the relationship between theology and natural science, insofar as both can then function as disciplines that train one to treat the world, experience the world as creation. But elaboration of that point will have to wait for another day. With that, we come to a conclusion. I have argued that Schleiermacher defends a theological diagnosis of characteristically modern anxieties about the possibility of freedom in a world governed by laws of nature. The diagnosis, simply stated, is that relative antitheses, such as that between freedom and necessity, come to seem absolute just insofar as one is forgetful of that which transcends the world, namely God. I then argued that Schleiermacher offers us a theological solution to this problem, the basic steps of which are as follows. A, that God is simple, which means that God is not only eternally in act, but eternally in one act. 
From this it follows B, that the fabric-like character of creation can be understood as an expression of this one act. C, that this one act of God comes to full expression in the incarnation, which shows us that God's single act is an act of love, and that the fabric of creation is thus an expression of that love. And finally, D, that the Spirit of Christ gives us eyes to see more and more of God's wise love in creation, and so to reconcile more and more of the apparent antitheses between freedom and necessity. In light of this solution, I wrapped up the paper by highlighting one potential insight we might draw from Schleiermacher's approach, namely his practical doctrine of creation, according to which persons must cultivate various practices and dispositions so as to treat the world as God's good creation. We may disagree with any or all of these arguments. I suspect that some of you will, and here I should look at my friend Tom McCall. But they are surely more interesting than the spinelessly accommodationist views usually ascribed to Schleiermacher. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. I will <laughs> refrain. Um, <laughs> this is a great paper. Um, we are here to uh, learn from the history of modern theology, both with respect to positive gains that have sometimes been forgotten, you know, lessons we can learn or relearn that are helpful to us. We're here to learn from missteps or mistakes that have been made as well. And I'm sure that many of us will judge uh, some of these contributions differently in these, in these respects. We do have time for a few questions. And I invite you um, to, here's how we'll, to ask questions. Here's how we'll do it. We've got a couple of helpers here with microphones in the back. If you'll raise a hand, um, just leave the hand up. I'll call upon you and direct the microphone to you. If we have a bunch of these, I'll just put you in a queue, and we'll proceed as far as we can. So do we have any questions uh, for yeah. David Louie in the back? Hi, David. Professor Hector, thank you Good for a crystal again. clear paper. Um, I'm curious about the God-world relation that's implicit in the sort of anatomy that you unpacked for us. The God who is eternally in one act, the world that is the expression of that one act, Christ who is the, I think you used the word, he re reproduces the act or he's the full expression. But are those acts all sort of layers within one act or are there actual meaningful distinctions between those actions? So I guess I'm ultimately getting at the, the lingering concern that Schleiermacher is a kind of pantheist. I'm curious to hear you. Um, <laughs> Do you know sort the of, term panentheism was invented to try to make sense of what Schleiermacher was up to? Yeah. So I'm just I'm wanting people. to help uh, have you help me right. understand kind of what's his understanding of the God-world relation. Right. Uh, Great thank question. You. Uh, so um, Schleiermacher would say that from God's side, so to speak, it's one act. In eternity, there is just the one act of God in which God eternally subsists, right? So God eternally just is this act of reconciling love. But odd extra, so facing outward, so to speak, or from our side, this one act, uh, it, it does have uh, stages in it. Right? So it's, you can think of it as a kind of three-act play. There's the initial creation, there is the appearance of the Redeemer, and the, this new possibility of redemption, which raises creation. To, it's not a restoring of the, the possibilities that were you know, inherent in creation at the beginning. Rather, it's this raising to new possibility through the Redeemer, and then finally there is some kind of eternal consummation which Schleiermacher, uh, in principle, tells us nothing about but there is something there that we don't know beyond that. Good I'll follow question. that up with the, just a, <laughs> a quick follow-up question. Yeah. It seems to me that um, one, in, one way of understanding Schleimacher from what I've read and from what you've said is to take him, his doctrine of the Trinity then is either being, um, because it's related to God's expression in Christ and the Spirit. One way of understanding that is to say that creation is contingent and the doctrine that Trinity would also be contingent. Another way it would be to say, no, his tr Trinity is, God is necessarily triune, mm -hmm. but that's wrapped up with God necessarily being creator and God necessarily being everything else. Yes. Um, is that a, it the seems like that might, the, right. the second of those is a way to understand right. Schleimacher. So 
traditionally Christians have you know, a firm doctrine of contingency, the contingency of creation. And it seems like uh, Schleimacher or someone who follows Schleimacher could say, absolutely we believe in contingency because of dependence, right? This absolute dependence. But sometimes Christians, I think, often have also intended contingency to mean something like could be or not be. Mm. And that seems like Schleimacher would go for the former of those with, on steroids perhaps, but not the latter. Is that right? Uh, so I lost you at the very end. What's the former? The former would be contingency as a sense of utter absolute dependence. Ah, yes, right. Um, the second would, the latter would be contingency as could be or not be. Right. So contingency in the sense of our position vis-a-vis -vis the world, yeah. absolutely. But contingency doesn't go all the way down sure. or all the yeah. way up yeah. because God can't be otherwise than, than God is. And God is committed to reconciling love. That's, that is that in which God has God's being, right? Such that um, is, is God's triunity dependent in some respect on uh, becoming incarnate and, and reconciling the world to himself? Yes. Does that mean that God is only contingently triune? No. Because God has eternally and necessarily been in the act of reconciling. And therefore God has eternally been in the act of breathing forth this word of reconciliation and, and spirating, he doesn't use the word spirating, a spirit who would draw others and draw all of creation into this reconciliation, Thanks. right? Yeah. So because of the necessitarianism at the top, contingency yeah. doesn't go all the sure. way down. Sure, I understand. Uh, we've got uh, Christoph Schwobel, Professor Schwobel. brilliant and very sympathetic account of Schleimacher's Doctor of Creation. Uh, sympathetic to Schleimacher and also sympathetic to my view of seeing Schleimacher. Hmm. I have one um, systematic difficulty with that and that is, um, do you think it's necessary if one follows Schleimacher's line of reflection that everything has to go through the eye of the needle of immediate self-consciousness uh, so that um, Self-consciousness is the basic concept that organizes both our relationship to God, our relationship to ourselves, which is the dominant one, our relationship to other people, and our relationship to nature. If one follows uh, Schleiermacher's analysis, um, immediate self-consciousness is itself relationally constituted, although he then subsumes this relationality under the title of consciousness, so that is Jesus' God consciousness mm -hmm. and our self-consciousness. and. Um, and so on. But that, of course, means that uh, categories of identity um, are always, um, in a way, subtracted from the alterity that really uh, constitute them, although they are constituted by particular kinds of reciprocity, symmetrical in our relationship to other finite entities, asymmetrical in our relationship of absolute dependence on God. Mm -hmm. Now, if one would have to say Schleiermacher's account remains basically true without the eye of the needle, we would have a far more relational account in which, for example, petitionary prayer would mean the engagement with another and not a change of my attitudes to, to, towards the mm -hmm. way things happen in the world. Um, attention to creation um, would not only be, so to say, a, a fine-tuning uh, for a general givenness, which I first of all experience in my self-consciousness, but a fine-tuning to a particular modified, structured givenness, which is there in the world, which would make it, I think, much more plausible to say that both um, theology and the natural sciences are practices of attention to, mm -hmm. well, not only the structure as mirrored in self-consciousness, right. but the very particularity that's there. So that would be the question, does that really, I know that it is like that in Schleiermacher, uh, but I wonder whether that's systematically ne necessary on the basis of your re reconstruction. Right. Uh, this is a great question. I'm, I'm sympathetic to the impulse underlying it. Uh, and sometimes I've thought what we need to do is revise this notion of immediate self-consciousness. Sometimes I've thought there are resources, especially within his broader corpus, that help us to broaden it out such that we can take it as explanatorily basic 
but not the eye of the needle, so to speak, right? Or the, the kind of bottleneck that everything has to sort of work its way through. Um, I do, I am inclined to say in light of his broader corpus that, um, I, I take it that you'd agree with me, that, that, that uh, immediate consciousness or gefühl isn't uh, to be confused with inwardness or isolation from relationality. And I take it that, especially as it's used at the, at the outset of the Glaubenslehre, um, that it's, it's meant to do a kind of formal work. And though what we should really do is understand what this concept means in light of the later doctrinal outworking of this, in light of what Christ's spirit does to open people up to um, the kind of relationship with God that you mentioned. In any case, um, I think you're right that an eye of needle approach, uh, I don't think it's necessary to his system, but if it were, I would say we shouldn't follow him. We have uh, time for, uh, for a short break. We've got some refreshments out in the hallway. We do want to begin on time so we can keep stay on schedule. Uh, we reconvene at 9.45. Uh, please be here then for uh, Professor Brad Gunlock's paper on B.B. Warfield on evolution and theology. Will you join me in thanking Dr. Acker?